Okay, it is 2.22 in the morning, so I'm going to talk a little bit lower and hopefully not wake up any kiddo upstairs trying to sleep. So if you hear any knocking around, this will be my three rescue cats that are playing, and I'm going to try to keep them as quiet as I can um, while they're still hanging out of my home until they find another happy place to stay forever. So um, grab your soda, grab your snack and we will blow through this pretty quick. We got 41 slides to go through, so just relax, listen to the words that are coming out of my mouth, know that everything you need is already in your review. Um, this is just an extension of that review. Okay, my nerds and Bruce Banner wannabes, we're gonna go over wavelengths and rays. No gammas today. Uh, maybe we'll get some gamma later on. Um, but UV radiation, just remember, it's part of the natural energy produced by the sun. Um, on the electromagnetic spectrum, UV light has a shorter wavelength uh, than visible light, so your eyes can't see UV, but you can absolutely feel it when you burn yourself. Um, there's two types of UV light that are proven to contribute to the risk for skin cancer. There's ultraviolet A and ultraviolet B wavelength. Um, ultraviolet A, I want you to remember that it's associated with skin aging. It's a longer wavelength that takes longer to get there, just like it takes a long time, hopefully, if you're lucky, to be born, to you know go through your life, and then to have natural aging. Um, so maybe that'll be the easier contributor. So UVA, A for aging. Um, so we see this in uh, tanning. It will contribute to the process of you aging. Think of the tan mom. Man, if I had a picture in a licensed agreement, she would be front and center on this slide. Um, UVB, um, I want you to think about UVB has a shorter wavelength. So B for burn. Um, obviously, it's associated with skin burning. So think of UV, UVB as a microwave. You throw something in the microwave, you cook it for 30 seconds, it's hot, it's burned if you put it on for too long. So those are easy ways to remember that. And then, of course, sun protection. Make sure you wear your protective clothing and sunscreen. If I do recall correctly, I think I remember in your review us going over um, striation and uh, red uh, small papules um, that are reddened in the neck and the face area. This is a direct indicator that someone has been uh, out in the sun for too long and we need to educate them on dun -dun -dun -dun, wearing sunscreen. This is still a discussion after all these years because apparently in the western world we got to cook ourselves in order to feel beautiful. Mm. I, I can't figure it out, guys, but just remember those two concepts and we should be good for this slide. So skin care risk factors, um, fair skin, that's pretty obvious. Um, you have less melanin in your skin, therefore you have easier reception for this light without protection. Um, blonde or red hair, think about that for a second. Uh, it's easier to penetrate anything that is the opposite of darker. Um, I know this sounds like a very simple concept, but breaking it down as easy as I can without an immense amount of pathophysiology that you do not need. Just remember, light equals light rays. They like it very much. Um, blue eyes. So everyone goes, why do blue eyes matter? Well, blue eyes are blue eyes because you don't have enough melanin in your eyes, which is why brown eyes can stare at the sun. Um, which I would never recommend you do, but if you are facing the sun, you don't squint as much if you, if you notice when you're dealing with a brown eyed person like myself versus someone with blue eyes who um, are never able to really keep those eyes open uh, very well. Uh, they squint really bad if they get uh, within, you know, a, a fair amount of uh, sunlight uh, without any any kind of trees or anything to separate them from that light path. Um, outdoor sunbathing, I would never recommend doing this. I don't know why this was ever cool in the beginning. I still don't know why this is cool to do because I would rather have translucent powder skin um, that is healthy and clean than to have darkened skin that's gonna age me 50 years and five. So obviously outdoor bathing, is not the smartest thing to do ever, uh, not even close. I'm living near the equator, high altitudes. So the equator, obviously, if I am shining a light at a ball and they're even with one another, 
um, the most intensity is going to be focused on the center or the equator. And then as you go around the curvature of that sphere, um, of course, your outskirts of your north and south poles are going to get less. So again, that's pretty self-explanatory. High altitudes, um, obviously, you're closer to the sun. But more importantly, you, um, as you go up higher, there is uh, a less likelihood of things like trees um, to grow uh, because it's you know difficult in that kind of terrain. So um, you have more exposure and you're higher up, and that's all there is to it. Um, and obviously, if you have a history of skin cancer in your family, this you know, plays a part in genetics, which is also a pretty heavy risk factor. All right, so in volume, when we talked about acetonic keratosis, and I mentioned how it kind of looks like acid, acid burns, acetonic. Um, it is the premalignant skin lesion. It's like a rough scaly patch on the skin. Um, it's caused by years and years of sun exposure. It usually affects older adults. Um, of course, reduction in skin exposure can help the risk. Um, it's treatable. It uh, occurs in 3 million people per year. Um, very common. It's often more easily felt than seen. It's like a dry, rough uh, patch to touch. Sometimes it's raw, sensitive, and painful. Sometimes it's itchy and prickly with burning sensation. Um, it looks and feels inflamed. In a rare instances, it can actually bleed or develop like a persistent sore um, or an ulceration. Whereas basal cell is a type of skin cancer that begins, obviously, in the basal cells. Um, it produces new skin cells as the old ones die. So limiting sun exposure can help prevent these cells from becoming cancerous. Again, very, very common. More than 3 million cases a year in the United States. Um, it typically appears as a white, uh, waxy lump or brown scaly patch um, on sun exposed areas like the face and the neck. Um, it's kind of raised a lot of times. Um, I wish there was an easy way to remember what exactly it looked like, but it's like, I'm going to look in the next slide. Like I said, it's, it's very shiny. It's very waxy looking. It's very um, asymmetrical. Um, it's the most common type of skin cancer and luckily enough the least deadly so whenever you start to notice uh, this type of skin change obviously you go in and a lot of times they they freeze it they cut it they surgically remove it they bore it uh, they use uh, one of those curettes that we talked about um, that scoops it out if you will um, and then you're done so just make sure that you're limiting your risk regardless when it comes to sun exposure so looking at basal cell carcinoma, the first thing I think of is it kind of looks like an ear. And if you notice what's in the middle, the waxy stuff. So maybe that'll be an easy way for you to remember if you ever see a picture of this um, in an examination. Um, professors love to do pictures and say, hey, what is this? Um, your NCLEX love. To, loves to show pictures and say, hey, what is this? And the great thing is the picture is basically always the same picture you're going to look at. Um, a good example of us doing this in the examinations that I've seen in the last 10 years is, um, you know, the really wide-eyed lady that we see when we're talking about thyroid storm. She's got the bug eyes and she's the thin gal. Um, it's the same type of picture that you're always going to see. So this basal cell carcinoma picture, I have probably seen the upwards of, 10 to 15 examinations over the past 10 years. And these are the only times that I ever see basal cell carcinoma as this classic picture. So just try to commit it to memory. Know that it looks like an ear. Know that ears have wax. Know that that looks like earwax inside of an ear. Um, and I think you should be good to go. All right, um, squamous cell or squamous cell carcinoma, depending on if you say tomato or tomato, it doesn't matter. Um, it is, there's a potential for it to metastasize. Um, this is the classic um, facial, I want to call it a lesion because it almost looks like a scab um, that you get in the older gentleman. You usually see it at the top of the ear. You'll see it on the nose. Um, you'll see it on the lips sometimes. Um, and it's found most frequently on the upper extremities in the face, which are exposed to the sun. Um, sometimes they're small and red. Sometimes they're a nodular lesion. Um, they develop secondarily uh, to 
precancerous lesions such as keratosis and leukoplakia. Um, it develops rapidly and it may metastasize through local lymph nodes, so you got to watch out for it. Uh, immunosuppression is going to lead to the dramatic increase in the incidence of them. Um, and again, I see this in very older gentlemen uh, because those are the ones that have gotten almost ulcerated looking. So if you ever see someone um, with a scab on their nose and just a, a ridiculous amount of crust, um, and you kind of raise an eyebrow at it and think it's like a scab that's healing and they go, no, it's been there forever. Or you see it on the top of their hand around the knuckles is a good classic area. Um, just know that that is more than likely what that is. And as much as I'd love to show you a picture of what this looks like, I'm gonna just tell you to give it a, a Dr. Google, if you will, because there's 10,000 pictures of what this looks like. Um, it's raised, it looks like looks like acne vulgaris that someone's been picking at and picking at so it's healed but then opened up again um, it's kind of nasty looking uh, kind of looks like a barnacle on the back but it's on the face and it's smaller and it's open and sometimes you have a little serous thing coming out of it uh, it's just bizarre so give it a go and looking at it I'm not going to test you I just really want you to know what the difference is and I'm a visual person and I've noticed a lot of you are visual people like myself so like I said give it a Dr. Google and be done with it. Alright so case study a 45 year old white female with strawberry blonde hair and blue eyes works at a garden center well isn't that just ironic um, she's come to the dermatology clinic because she noticed that the mole on her left shoulder has increased in size and has darkened in color so we already know where this is going let's see what happens all right so malignant melanoma so malignant melanoma arises from the pigment producing melanocytes the color um, of the lesions can vary greatly sometimes it's white sometimes it's flesh color sometimes it's gray sometimes it's brown heck sometimes it's blue and black to be quite fair um, it's suspected when there's change in size, color, sensation, um, characteristics of a mole. Um, they're, they're the most serious type um, because it metastasizes in the blood and when that happens it can be quite extensive. Um, symptoms, they include like new unusual growths or changes in an existing uh, mole. Know that the most important uh, indicator of this is that it's usually multicolored. It's never just black. A lot of people think that it's uh, when something goes from brown to black that that's melanoma. That is not the case. What happens is, is your existing mole starts to um, seethe out and starts to make like rigid borders um, and then sometimes those rigid borders turn into like raggedy borders so um, it kind of looks like a state in the outside parameters um, and obviously that's going to be a big problem because it is the, the most highly contractible uh, it metastasizes fast um, sometimes stuff will ooze out of it uh, there's enlargement and elevation it's usually greater than six millimeters in diameter um, and this will continue to change uh, size over time now what does it feel like it feels itchy um, it's tender it's painful there's change in texture there's scale sometimes it oozes sometimes it bleeds from the existing mole um, in your eyes you can have blurry vision partial loss of sight um, or dark spots in your iris so one of the the one of the things that uh, separates or, or is um, often misunderstood as a traditional melanoma is what they call a dysplastic nevus um, or nevi it's a type of mole that looks different from a common mole hey that really helps you guys out right um, some doctors use the term atypical mole to refer uh, to it as a, a dysplastic uh, nevi um, it may be bigger than the common mole um, and its color and surface and border may be different. It's usually more than five millimeters wide. Um, how serious is it? It's an aggressive and potential deadly form of skin cancer. So uh, this is seen a lot um, with people who have uh, familial genetic propensity for uh, having a lot of moles. Should you be worried about an atypical mole? Um, they're not cancerous. They need to be removed if they're not changing. If it progresses over a long time, they're left alone, um, and you decide to just jump into the sun all of the time, this can obviously turn into something much worse. 
um, and it goes much worse and it goes much worse in a terrible way. But we're talking about less than 6% of a lifetime risk of melanoma when we're talking about these lesions. And again, dysplastic nevi, it basically is somebody that has um, a lot of moles kind of everywhere. This one is more flattened. This one doesn't ooze. This one doesn't bleed. It doesn't have scales. If you notice, it's not white. It's not blue. Um, it looks more like a freckle that somebody just kind of smeared about your skin. So it can be a problem. And when it becomes a problem, it's a big problem. Um, but usually it's a benign process that is just seen um, as something that's normal and more genetic um, in its origin. All right, so risk factors for malignant melanoma are very similar to just risk for sun exposure and being burned faster. Red or blonde hair, light colored eyes, um, fair skin that freckles, chronic sun exposure, family history. Now, let me go ahead and throw my little caveat here because you know how I like to throw in a, hey, guess what? Um, let me ruin some, some, some hopes and dreams here. Um, if you were born with black hair, and you decide to be like BTS, which ironically enough stings, stands for um, bang tan, bang tan, boys. Um, if I were you, I would understand. If you're born with black hair and you go dyeing your hair white blonde like these guys, although it is extremely pretty and beautiful and you've never looked more clean and fresh and bright, um, the sun will look at that and go, mm, sounds tasty, and it will penetrate through. This is a light spectrum issue. This isn't a genetic, I was born with blonde hair, I was born with red hair. Yeah, the sun doesn't discriminate when it comes to that if you choose to wear lighter color spectrum items. So classic example, if you wear a black t-shirt, it's hotter because why? Because it, it causes an insulator of that sun exposure. Um, it's not going to penetrate into the skin as much versus if you wear a white t-shirt that's going to basically take that, absorb it, bounce it back, and then you are less hot with a white t-shirt. So don't think that if you have this gorgeous white blonde hair that the sun is not going to go yummy, yummy in my tummy, penetrate through it, and then burn that scalp because it's absolutely what is going to happen. Darker hair has a different type of spectrum catch, so it is going to be more difficult for that sun to penetrate into that and then hit the top of your scalp and start affecting that. So again, don't be a bang tan boy, and if you are, make sure you wear a hat. That's why I constantly have a backwards hat on because I'm not trying to get any kind of skin cancer. Okay, so we're going back to our lady who has a mole and notes that it's five millimeters by eight millimeters in diameter and it's shaped like a jagged pebble. Hmm. She notices the changes of uh, color and it's changed from brown to black and it has increased in size and it feels bumpy. So we're getting a little more suspicious. Our sizes are letting us know that this probably isn't something we're excited about. Um, so let's see what happens as it unfolds. Okay, the ABCDE rule, I like this. It's easy to remember to me because ABCDE. So asymmetry, uh, borders irregularly, color changes, diameter greater than six millimeters, and evolving in appearance. So keep that in mind. You need to know your ABCDEs. It's really, really important because this is gonna be an opportunity for what? Bump on and all, a select all that apply. Although I can tell you right now that everything you need to know, again, is in your review. So what we are doing here is we are reviewing pathophysiology because you guys missed a lot, it sounds like. So I'm just trying to break it down easy peasy, lemon squeezy so that you understand the concepts. You will, I repeat, you will, one more time, you will be seeing this later on in life. This will be a select all that apply question. This is a classic HESI question. This is a classic question on your NCLEX. And it will be a drag and drop opportunity, I am sure. So make sure you understand A, B, C, D, and E. And here are some slides of the different types of malignant melanoma. As you can see, some of it's red and brown mixed. Um, the one that is in D square, um, if you notice, there's a, a little bit of um, what I call like a watermark over the brown. There's a little bit of reddish tan color. 
A is pretty obvious because there's your mole and then there it goes kind of bleeding out. Uh, we got a browner spot and we got a little bit of red brown, got a little bit of copper color here and then C, I, you get the gist. It's different colors mixed together. Sometimes it's ray, sometimes it's oozy. Um, and honestly, if you don't know what it is, a lot of people don't. There are only a handful of people that really, really get skin conditions well. And I'll be honest with you, it's really not necessarily a primary provider. Primary providers will look at this and go, mm, I don't know. I'm just going to go ahead and refer you over. And whenever we see this in the hospital setting, this is just going to be an outpatient appointment because the professionals need to stay with the skin. And those are dermatological people. That is not me. And I will never be this person. You're having a stroke. I got your back. You give me a skin lesion. I'm like, yeah, go see that guy over there. So just kind of look at it. Commit it to memory as best as you can move on because you're never really going to truly know what this looks like and what it really is unless it's so obvious that it's you know the size of half of a fist and they're complaining about pain all right so diagnosis is done uh, by dermoscope basically derm skin scope checking it out so that's easy um, incisional biopsy as well um, why are we doing an incisional biopsy? So you do an incisional biopsy versus um, like a borehole or um, a curette that scoops because these things are down. Remember how I talked in volume one about how these things grow from the inside and then out. And by the time you get the out part, it's already, it's already done its justice, um, which is why we have to do an incisional biopsy. We will literally um, slice it open and then we will biopsy the deepest part of it if we can get there. Um, this is based off of tumor thickness and there's two measurements that they use. They use a Breslow measurement and the Clark level. The Clark level is a staging system. It describes the level of anatomical evasion of the melanoma in the skin. Um, it was developed by Wallace H. Clark Jr. at Harvard University um, and Massachusetts General Hospital in the 1960s. And the only reason I know that is because I'm a nerd and you guys need not apply. So um, it's a level that was used back in the day, but then we came up with uh, Breslow, which was a much better measurement. We're gonna talk about that in a second, and it measures from the inside out, not the outside in. All right, so Breslow measurement, here we go. This is the biopsy specimen. We grab a whole big pinch of it, and then we actually biopsy the inside piece of it like we just talked about. This is important. Remember how I talked about the epidermis and how it doesn't really have a big blood supply? Well, as you go down to papillary dermi, to the reticular dermi, that's when we start getting this, uh, this vasculature. And whenever you got blood, you got lymph. And whenever you got lymph, you got, oh boy, this just got everywhere. So this is why it's so important to try to check it out and notice it as soon as you can, because these things don't just grow up, they grow out as they grow up. If you notice in this diagram, um, it starts to get really, really thin, and then as you go up, it gets thicker and thicker and thicker. Um, what happens over time, if this isn't treated, is that thickness up top will then bounce back down to the bottom, and this little bit of a cone that we have at the very tip um, or the beginning of this will start to stretch out as well. And the more you stretch it out into this area, just like sepsis, the more you can infect the blood and then infect the body, and then that's how you get mets, and this does not go very well at all. All right, so just like we thought, we're suspicious that this is a bad thing, so we do an incisional biopsy. Diagnosis of malignant melanoma is confirmed. So what factors will determine the next steps in treatment? Anybody know? So I would guess out of common sense that size probably has something to do with it, that depth will probably have something to do with it. Um, that time that this has been left alone, if we know what that looks like, is going to be also a proponent in determining the next steps um, in treatment. And let's also not forget the patient will also determine the next steps in treatment. A lot of patients will do uh, the denial tour. So denial is not just a river in Egypt, it's a thing. And I will tell a patient, hey, guess what? You've got something that is going to potentially kill you. And they will go, man, I'll, it's fine. I'll look at somebody else. You don't know what you're talking about. And I'll be like, all right, cool. Yeah, you're right. I'm just 
$350,000 in debt from college tuition so that I could look at you and say something stupid. You could not be more accurate. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you. But I can't. I smile and I go, okay, well, I understand that, but you need to make your appointment. And um, I usually call them and then have the doctor call them and usually get so annoying that they show up um, just so I will leave them alone. And that is when I'm fairly convinced, and by fairly I mean 90% or more, that this is something that's a terrible thing. Um, farmers are miserable trying to get them to do anything. So I always hope and pray that they come in with, I don't know, something uh, that is so gnarly. Um, you know, they, they mess with their toes and break something. They, you know, have an accidental injury so that I can examine their skin. Uh, so when you do see these guys that do come in, they have the overalls on, um, they're the classic old school guy, and uh, you'll look at their face and see all of the sun exposure, you'll see the acidic um, keratosis, and you'll be like, ah, let me go ahead and just do a skin assessment, which is also why the first thing that we do is a head-to-toe skin assessment on these patients. It's not just looking for wounds. It's also looking for um, this malignant melanoma and signs and symptoms of such. So make sure you're hammering down on these guys because they are stubborn, and you're going to have to be a little more... Um, forward in your movement and in your speech and in your verbiage um, than you would somebody who, um, you know, is a school teacher for a living. All right, so interprofessional care treatment is determined by, hey, guess what? The size and the stage of the cancer. Bum, ba, na, na. Common sense. So um, this includes a wide surgical incision that we're normally going to make because these things get really, really, really deep sometimes. Um, and you don't really know what that looks like until you get in there. So this is the type of surgery where we would love to know exactly how deep we're going to cut into it. And nine times out of ten, we realize it's a little bit greater than we had originally expected um, because this has been hanging around for much longer than we had originally anticipated. So um, this would be called adjuvant therapy or adjunct therapy. You don't need to know these things uh, necessarily. Just know that it's determined by the, the tumor size um, and the stage of cancer. Okay, so tumor staging, I'm actually going to give you the stages one through four um, because just for your personal comfort and the fact that it's probably going to come back in an NCLEX potentially, um, and that funny? Probably, and then potentially. See how I just did that? Uh, jumbo shrimp, guys. So uh, tumor staging is important to know. Um, zero to four, honestly, stage three of, of skin cancer gets really hairy because they got, you know, 3A, B, C, and D, which gets ridiculous. So I'm just going to play the KISS method, which is what my dad used to say, which is keep it simple, stupid. So here we go. Uh, cancer for stage zero. Um, it's confined to the epidermis, the outermost layer of the skin. It's not spread to nearby lymph nodes. Um, it's not in distant parts of the body. So that's an easy way to remember it. It's kind of boring, which is, in this case, is good. Um, stage one, the tumor is no more than two millimeters. Um, it's thick. Uh, it may or may, or may not be ulcerated. Um, the cancer hasn't spread necessarily to two lymph nodes or distant parts of the body, just like stage zero. Um, stage two is usually a millimeter thick or more. Um, it may be thicker than four millimeters. Um, it may or may not be ulcerated. Uh, it's not sped, spread to near, nearby lymph nodes uh, or distant parts of the body. So we're still at this point doing pretty well. Now here's where we get really weird. Stage three, the tumor is no more than two millimeters thick. It may or may not be ulcerated. The cancer is spread to one or three nearby lymph nodes. Um, but it's so small that it's only seen under a microscope. So good luck trying to figure that one out. Um, there's no sign of the primary tumor and the cancer is spread only to one nearby lymph node or it's spread into very small areas in nearby skin. You see what I'm getting at here? Like we just get so, um, so ridiculously uh, concentrated in our thought when we get into, you know, 3A, B3, 3C, 3D. Just remember when we get to 3, this is when we go from um, can't really see it spread about to yeah, it's there, but it's microscopic um, and it's in one to three locations. And then when you get to four, the tumor might be any thickness. It may or may not be ulcerated. Um, it may or may not have spread to nearby lymph nodes. It 
spreads to distant lymph nodes or, or organs such as uh, the lungs, liver, the brain. Um, skin usually goes lungs, liver, brain. Um, so whenever you see these people, you will notice that these 80-year-old farmers with melanoma, um, I see this a lot, or tan moms that come in and they're in their mid-60s, you'll see this too. They'll come in with altered mental status. And when you get somebody with altered mental status and you see one of these guys, it's usually on their back. It's usually about the size of my thumb. And they're usually constantly scratching at it and going, I don't know what's going on with this thing. It's annoying. I've been meaning to go to the doctor about it. I've been meaning to go to the doctor about it. Farmers hate doctors. Farmers hate doctors. People in agriculture cannot stand a doctor because they can't be bothered. A little bit about the history of farmers. I have, well, I had a small farm at one point. Uh, it was, I don't know, 230 acres on a Civil War deed back in the day. Um, it was in the lower part of Ohio, right at the border um, of Aberdeen, Kentucky, and it was nothing but farmers. And I learned how stubborn farmers were um, working there because they did Holstein cattle, and it's a seven-day-a-week milking experience, as in you sun up to sundown or milking cows three times a day. It is ridiculous. These guys are underworked, or overworked, underpaid. They barely sleep. Um, they're trying to support their families. A lot of times these guys only have a 10th grade education because what can you do in the 10th grade legally? You can be a part of FFA and miss half of the day in school. So uh, people are notorious in these type of areas where they pull their kid out of school so that they have an extra hand on the farm. And it makes me sad on the inside because these people are very intelligent people that never learn how to do things like finances um, or accounting or the things that they need um, to be successful in this world. So they're constantly um, having a bad way. And what is expensive? A doctor copay, for sure. Some of these copays um, are 50, 100 bucks a piece because they have really poor insurance or no insurance at all and they can't be bothered. So they use the patch and dirt method, which is what I call. So God made dirt, dirt don't hurt is how they put things. So just patch it up and be done. Um, so they'll come in with ultra mental status. Their wives will be very upset uh, because these gentlemen will all of a sudden be really irritable, be really nasty to them. Uh, you know, you've been married to someone for 35 years and things have gone pretty swell because you barely see each other. So those kind of relationships work really well. And all of a sudden, you know, he's making really snide comments. He's he's really snippy. Um, and they'll bring them in uh, because they're terrified for their mental status change. They'll think that it's, uh, you know, something with their medication. They haven't been taking it. They took too much. Um, and then you'll do a skin assessment. And you'll go, oh, my God. And you'll know that this is meant to the brain. You've got, got, got to talk to your doctor immediately um, because when they start having lung problems, histoplasmosis runs really mm -hmm. prominent in farming communities because of chickens and chicken poop. And when you're shoveling chicken poop, um, it goes into your lungs. So they'll have the farmer cough, which sounds different than a smoker cough, but um, it's more... Uh, wheezy when they cough. That kind of sounds like a high-pitched wheeze. Um, you can't mistake it. And you'll know that that isn't histoplasmosis. That is met to the lung and to the brain. I know I just spent six minutes talking about this, but it's that important because some of you will be working in these rural areas and rural communities. And these this is it's the classic demographic for this problem. And while you might not be able to save their life at this point, you might be able to increase the longevity and quality of their life through treatment. So make sure that you jump on this as fast as you can if you see it. So immunotherapy, when we're talking about um, people who have confirmed cancer, so there's inhibitors. And basically all I need for you to know about this is depending on what is, um, what is targeted specific to um, the cell that is creating the cancer, um, you're going to be using these inhibitors. So what it does is it inhibits it 
from sending that message over that says, hey, this is cancer, go run around and, and spread about, right? Like, go forth and prosper, you know, go forth and procreate type of a deal. So I'm not going to get into recumbent DNA. That is for the super nerds, and that's not even in my bag. I'm over in the corner playing D&D as a neurologist. Those guys are sitting in the bathroom eating their sandwich because nobody wants to be around them, right? So they're just staring at a microscope all day. Let that be their job. We're not going to worry about it. What I do want you to know and what I do remember from this is if it does come up, it's going to be what are some treatment methods um, that specifically target the cell when referencing uh, malignant melanoma and your answers are going to be all of this and then some answer that doesn't even make sense. So if you see something and it looks like something that you'd see in Star Wars like R2-D2, C-3PO, CTLA-4 inhibitor, then those are the right answers and whatever is left over is the answer that you choose or if it is a drag and drop. Um, just remember if it, if it confuses you in your brain, then it's probably the right answer when we're talking about immunotherapy. I've only ever seen one instance where that happened. I got that NCLEX question and I just kind of went, Ooh, and then moved about my life and I must've hit the right answer because I, I clocked out in 42 minutes and locked out at 75 questions. So here's doing a thumbs up because I got lucky ducky, um, cause this stuff is way too complicated even for me. Um, targeted therapy, you got the breath and the MEK inhibitors. Again, if it doesn't make sense to you, just know that it's attributed to cancer and immunotherapy and move on. Seriously, you're not going to get this in depth. Not even if you decide to be a physician one day, unless you decide to really hate your existence and get into molecular genetics uh, because you're just that cool. Dude, I want your autograph first off and second off. More power to you. All right, so... Um, we go back to our case study. Looks like the mole was in the lymph node and the axillary area, um, and it was dissected to assess for metastasis. Looks like lymph nodes are negative for cancer cells, so that's super cool. So this was probably like that diplastic nevi or dysplastic nevi, I've heard it called, uh, and dysplasia of nevi, like whatever you want to call that. So what it would be what would be called the atypical mole. Um, so good. Hey, listen, if we say something and we're wrong, then we just feel like an idiot for five seconds. If we say something and we're right, um, that's the only time in the world that you don't want to be right. So just hope you're wrong when you find these things and try to reassure your patient as they go along because they're going to be questioning their existence while they're waiting for these test results. So make sure you're being super sensitive to them. I'm a big fan of never saying things like, oh, don't be worried. It's in less than 6% of the people, right? I, man, I tell you, if it were me and I had to hear that, I probably would be in jail for assault. So I hope somebody would bail me out. I hope y'all got money. Because if anyone ever talked to me like that, I would go stupid. How dare a person tell another person how they should or shouldn't feel based off of something that they will never experience. So just keep that in mind because it's easy to say those things because we grew up with our mamas and daddies saying those things. And now we know better. Now we got the Google machine and the internet and a wealth of knowledge since the Alexandria library burned down. Again, I'm a nerd. I'm sorry, guys. So make sure that you're being incredibly sensitive to these people because they are incredibly hypersensitive. So we don't want to say stupid things to them that make them feel invalidated in their feelings. And I know I get it. I'm the person that never worries about anything except for when it comes to everybody else's feelings because I'm not a feeling person, but I respect feelings. Give mad respect to the name of feelings. I know it sounds silly, but you got to sit down with these guys. They're going to think they're going to die tomorrow, and it's to be warranted if they're emotional. So let them live in that moment and live in it with them. Be there for them. Okay. So case study part five of six. And again, this is the next gen type of questions that you're going to get. It literally is just going to go from question and scenario, question and scenario. So building onto this, it uh, looks like that they are questioned the type of surgery that was performed and how it was determined that all of the tumor was excised. Um, so it says what type of surgical procedure was likely used to excise the mole. So likely we did the surgical excision uh, with the lesion of the surrounding tissue. 
Um, if we are malignant, of course, we're going to do chemo surgery. Chemo surgery is different from chemotherapy because chemo surgery involves the use of like zinc chloride to fix the cells before they're dissected by layers. And that is to help prevent it from breaking apart in surgery and spreading it about to the lymph. So this is kind of hairy. If you go into a tumor and you go into it fresh and you just start chopping it about, it's kind of like if I have a tree that I cut down that's got pollen in it because you're in South Georgia in August, which means your car is yellow. I'm not joking. You can have a black car, but guess what? In the pollen season in Georgia, it is a bright yellow when you walk outside, so don't even try to wash your car. Digressing. This is what happens when you go to chop in tumors and you don't have them fused together. So they have this process of uh, like kind of like a fusion like situation where everything kind of clumps together and it becomes more dense in the cellular structure. So it's less likely to break off much like a clot or a DVT in your legs. Those pieces and parts break off and then they migrate up. Same concept. So they want to make sure that they use the zinc derivative because it helps harden that area. It helps clump them together so that when you do excise it, you get all of it. So this is a common question. Um, I would never take it to heart because that would be the first question I would ask. A lot of people get really upset when people say, did you get it all? Because they go, oh, no, I just did, you know, 13 years of college plus seven years of residency plus three years of surgical residency plus four years of derm dermatological fellowship just to be here so you can ask me if I got it all. Um, but I need for you to realize that you don't matter in this world if you ever become a, a surgeon, which would be super cool. Again, let me high five you if you get there in the world because that's fantastic. Um, but remember where you came from. Don't ever forget where you came from. Don't ever forget that you, a long time ago, were just as ignorant as the last person. And when you have sympathetic nervous system process triggered and you think you're going to die and you hear the word cancer, the first thing is you're going to ask is, did you get it all out? And the answer is going to be, uh-huh, most likely yes. Um, but make sure that you provide them with a lot of explanation because people who get general comments uh, when you're talking about sensitive issues like this, like, yes, I did. That is not a good enough answer. I need for you to know specifically what you did to do that. And I need for you to bore me with a ton of information like I'm boring you with a ton of information. Because at that point, I have shut you down of all questions and you're never going to question the integrity of the situation again. Um, I would encourage you to give more information than not because that's what these people need is proof positive that they should be confident when they walk out of that door and the clouds part and it's a brand new shiny day for them. So give it to them. Be humbled. Don't get your pride in the way. That's all I got to say about that. Okay, so. Looks like she's examining her shoulder. She tearfully expresses concern regarding the size of the incision and its location on her shoulder. All right. So here's where I have trouble in the world. Where I come from in the Western world, it's bizarre. It's like going to a circus. The Western world is in my brain because things like scars, who cares? <laughs> it is a direct, uh, it is a direct observation uh, and badge of honor where I come from. So scars, super cool, right? I don't understand why we worry about these things, but sure, I get it. Whatever. Um, it, when they have scarring, just try to be sympathetic. Of course, the scar that she sees is the size of the planet Pluto, and the size that you see is the size of a sweet pea and it doesn't even matter because guess what? It's on her shoulder. So how much is she really going to be exposing her shoulder? Hopefully not a lot because she just had a cancer scare. So tell her to keep the heck out of the sun. Um, but you have to be sensitive to people and how they prefer their pieces and parts to be. Um, sometimes people feel like they're less of an individual because they have these marks Again, I don't care. You will clearly see on my neck that there's a big old slice 
um, from an incident that I had, and I, who cares, right? I don't try to cover it up with anything. It is what it is. Um, I, I got scars all over me, and I think, you know, that's what makes me me, and that's fantastic. Um, some people prefer it that way. So try to encourage them and let them know, hey, listen, over time, the scar is going to get lighter. There are creams that you can use to lighten up scars. Uh, there's uh, over-the-counter medications uh, like... Nivea has a product um, that reduces stretch marks and scarring. Encourage them to use those items um, and try to move about it and try to give them um, words to let them know that they're not being silly in their thought process because it is a big deal to them. Um, but try to understand where they're coming from and let them know that there is a plan and option for them to have a reduction of that scarring. Um, and give them a product or uh, some advice on what products to choose to reduce that, that look of the scar and tell them it's going to take about six months for it to really, really heal well and for that scar to develop um, and let them know that over the next year to five years, it's not even going to be a thing anymore. Um, but try not to make them feel like they're over-exaggerating, I guess is what I'm trying to get at. So I'm going to go ahead and go over this question with you, and I'm also going to do what I call fighting this question, which is what I encourage you guys to do if you feel like you have a good reason to fight the idea of this question, because I know what the answer is on this, um, and I know what they're doing, and I know why they're doing it, and I don't even need to look at the answer. Um, I need for you to recognize what it is to fight a question, and I need to also understand uh, their rationale. Whoever wrote this question clearly is not Native American, but I'll get into that in a second. So which patient is at the highest risk for cancer? A 56-year-old Native American with colon polyps, okay, a 72-year-old retired high school chemistry teacher, okay, a 32-year-old who uses tanning booths twice a week, or a 44-year-old who regularly bathes with perfume soap, okay? Right off the bat, I don't care about the 44-year-old who regularly bathes with perfume soap. That ain't got nothing to do with what we're talking about. Ain't nothing going on but the rent with that one, as far as I'm concerned. A 72-year-old retired high school chemistry teacher. A 72-year-old retired person is not getting out in the sun to go bake. Okay, they're a chemistry teacher. They understand the science behind sun equals bad. Okay, so that one you knock off. Now, what, le what that leaves us with is a 56-year-old Native American with colon polyps and a 32-year-old who uses a tanning booth twice a week. Now, the answer I can tell you is going to be a 32-year-old who uses a tanning booth twice a week because the trigger words... Highest risk for cancer, tanning booth. Remember, tanning booth is what, UVA or UVB? It has to do with aging. So this is going to be the problem. If they use it twice a week over a period of time, this is going to cause a potential for malignant melanoma. Sorry, I don't know why I can't speak. Oh, yeah, it's because it's 3.39 a.m. Because I love you guys, so don't ever say that I don't care. Oh, I dare you to say I don't care. So digressing back. 32-year-old who uses a tanning booth twice a week is going to be the answer. They have the highest propensity as far as the general populace is concerned. Now, here's what I know about my people. A 56-year-old with colon polyps, Native Americans have a higher incident of a stomach cancer, uh, colon cancer, and guess what? Bum -ba -da -da, malignant melanoma because traditionally through genetics, again, we talked about retroactive genetics from ancestral times, what did my people do? Well, I tell you what they didn't do. Sit on their butt and watch TV while eating popcorn because that wasn't a thing. None of that was. And even now, we don't care because we want to stay away from the Western world. The fact that I'm out in the open is kind of a big deal. Um, like I said, my mom was Caucasian. You guys know that because you know a lot about me. So um, once I got introduced into the Western world later on in life, um, I realized why we stay away from it <laughs> because... Um, the things that we do in the States, as far as Western perspective, is not aligned with what my people think and believe and understand is the world around them. So my guys were out there, you know, hunting, gathering, uh, mound building, right? Praying to the ancestors, you know, sticking their toes into the sand, into the dirt, into the rubble. 
So um, although we are very intense in our emotions and our belief about uh, the, the modern day rock world that we live in and the spiritual realm, um, it also means that because we're out so much, we have a history of getting skin cancer a lot easier because we're out in the open. And guess what? We're usually out in the open wearing very little because it's hot. And when we're hot and we're running and we're trying to capture a deer because it's a thousand years ago and we have to eat, we're going to get sun exposure. The fact that we have colon polyps, colon polyps has an increased incident of colon cancer. So whenever you believe that there is an answer that should be the better answer, I want you to come fight me for it, quote unquote. That does not mean physically fight me. That's not going to go well. We're not going to do those things. That's silly. I do want you to explain to me, just like I've explained to you, why this answer is technically the better answer and technically the correct answer. The person that wrote this question does not know about Native American population very well, clearly. And if they did, they would have made this the answer. However, the clear answer for this case uses the trigger word tanning booth. So I want you to focus on those things for your NCLEX. If you see one like this and you go, I know Native American is the right answer. I know it down in my spirit, but I know that tanning booth is the trigger word. So we're going to use that one. And then come to me later if that's a thing and we will argue it out. And if it is a test that I am giving, then I will give you the point because A, I'm impressed that you have the ability to look at me dead in the eye with evidence-based practice and say, hey lady, you're wrong. That makes me happy on the inside because that means you're not afraid to talk to somebody. Um, and plus, you're right. And if you're right, it's fair, okay? But for the purposes of an examination that I have no control over, like a HESI or an NCLEX, just go for the trigger word, tanning booth. Jump on that one. It's twice a week. The incidence is going to be greater. Just do that, okay? Just, just do it. No big deal. And again, the answer is C, a 32-year-old who uses a tanning booth twice a week. Incidentally, we wouldn't imagine that this would be something they do for, you know, 25 years that information wasn't given. What was given was that a history of colon polyps in a, a group of people who have a higher propensity and incident of colon cancer, stomach cancer, uh, and melanoma because of their historical merit. So again, if you have a problem with it for my examinations, talk to me about it. If it's fair, it's fair, and I will give you the point. And if it's any other examination in the world, just pretend that you're just as ignorant as the person that wrote this question and move about. Tan in bed twice a week. Okay, fine. That's it. Go. Okay. So now we can get into something that I really feel comfortable talking about. I really don't like talking about cancer. Who does, right? Um, I don't like talking about skin cancer because that's always a gray area for most people. So we're going to talk about the things that we are going to know and we are going to see, which is bacterial infections, viral infections, infections in insect bites and fungal infections. So this will be easy. We'll blow through this pretty quick because we've heard this a million and a half times. All right. So allergic dermatolo dermatologic problems. Hey, guess what? Associated with allergies and hypersensitive reactions, allergic allergies, allergic hypersensitivity. Ooh, ah. All right. Family history and exposure um, is going to be one of the proponents and risk factors. Patch testing, we talked about patch testing in volume one, um, where we check to see what exactly we're allergic to. Some people are allergic to most things. Some people are allergic to grass, and that's where it gets a little hairy for them. Um, of course, we want to avoid the agent, which is a problem if we live in a rural area and you're allergic to grass. So sometimes we have to get creative with our treatment management and our preventative methods. Um, but just know that that's usually the standardized test is the patch test. Um, and then of course understand history and exposure and understand allergic dermatologic problems are associated with allergies. Okay, so cutaneous drug reactions, Steven Johnson syndrome. So Steven Johnson syndrome is pretty nasty to see. It's also very rare, so don't freak out. Um, it is a absolute medical emergency. Um, it is a reaction for or an infection process. Um, you see it a lot with medications. 
specifically allopurinol. Now allopurinol is a medication used for gout to reduce the inflammation. Um, Stephen Johnson syndrome is really ugly to look at. It literally looks like peeling. And when I say peeling, I mean it is peeling off with red blotchy patches. It looks like um, it's systemic, right? Um, your lips, the first layer literally comes off of it. Um, it's, I, I think I attribute it in our review as um, when you get Elmer's glue and you let it dry off on your skin and it peels like that, it actually peels much worse. Um, it looks like uh, the top layer of your skin is gone and everything up under it is, you know, the new stuff that's red and cracked and bleeding and scabbed over. Sometimes there's necrosis involved with it. I mean, if you want to give it a Google, all you have to do is just look at it the one time. You will never, I repeat, never forget what Steven Johnson's syndrome will look like. Um, so I'm going to make sure that for my Monday crew, uh, I reiterate what that looks like. Uh, in this case, allopurinol is something that happens quite often um, that has the, the highest risk for Steven Johnson syndrome, although there are other medications that do it as well. Uh, but when you have a patient that has gout and is on this medication, if you start to see these signs and symptoms, which starts off at that glue-like peeling stage, um, you immediately need to stop that medication and call the physician and let them know that you are not going to dose them again. They can get over themselves. It's not going to be a thing. Um, toxic epidermal necrosis. Again, this is a threatening skin disorder. Um, it's blisters and peeling of the skin. Um, also has to do with antibiotics, um, anticonvulsants. You'll see it a lot with things like um, dilantin because uh, you'll have to do phenytoin levels. Um, this is just as ugly looking. Um, although the uh, toxic epidermal necrosis uh, literally shaves off an entire top layer of your skin and I feel like it's even worse than Steven Johnson's because it goes deeper and um, I feel like Steven Johnson's is more blotchy patches of epidermal tissue loss whereas you would literally think that you skinned a person uh, when you're dealing with toxic epidermal necrosis. Um, so those are the two baddies. Um, Tin is more reflective of anticonvulsants or antibiotics whereas Steven Johnson syndrome um, has to do with uh, specifically an anti-inflammatory medication called allopurinol, which is for gout, and we need to stop that immediately. And I think I did mention that in review, so let's not forget that. All right, so benign dermatologic problems. Acne vulgaris, we all know what that is. Um, psoriasis and a seborrheic keratosis, which is what I call the back barnacles, if you've ever seen an old man. Um, you'll have these and you can literally scratch them off, although I would not encourage you to because they do crack and bleed. Um, they have a weird texture to them. They're, if you scratch at it, you'll realize it's a lot of little, little bitty patches um, and, and pieces and parts. I, I think of it as like alveolar sacs in the lungs, but on the outside uh, because it's kind of what it looks like. It looks like a whole bunch of little tiny ones that form into a big one. Um, they're cracked, they're dry, they look like bow barnacles on the back of an old person, um, which is completely benign. And a lot of people will see these and go, oh my God, it's malignant melanoma. So when you see this, I encourage you to first put on your gloves because that's gross. And second, uh, kind of go over it with the top of your fingernail, um, even with the glove. And when you see it spread apart like that and you see all the little cracks in between, you will know that this is absolutely not a malignant melanoma because your malignant melanomas will not be able to do that. Um, and they scratch off uh, little pieces and parts scratch off really easy. It looks like you haven't uh, washed your back and that's the reason that you have it, um, which is again, completely different than what you would see on a malignant melanoma. Give it a Dr. Google, um, give it an image search and you will know very quickly what this is because you'll be like, oh yeah, I've seen my grandpa with that. Or, oh yeah, I remember seeing that in that patient that day I was a tech. So when we're talking about dermatologic problems, there's a couple of modalities we can use. We can use uh, phototherapy, and that's usually good for um, acne vulgaris sometimes, uh, radiation therapy, 
we'll have to use that for um, you know things that uh, it need to be burned out basically because there's no other way of doing it laser usually cuts and cauterizes at the same time and then drug ter therapy like Accutane for acne vulgaris assuming that you are not pregnant because if you're taking Accutane which is uh, toxic to any babies that you might be bearing um, you would need to make sure that you stay on your birth control medication and that you are not pregnant if you're going to be on these medications and oh my god I totally remember talking about that about that in review so go ahead and check back on that slide and we'll get back into that here in a minute I'm sure okay so we're going to talk about the various ways that we uh, diagnose and treat uh, with surgical therapy so skin scraping is literally what it says um, we do skin scrapings for other things as well um, specifically I can think about skin scrapings for scabies well wow. skin scrapings for scabies say that five times fast so um, it literally is just getting a blade uh, usually it's um, like a razor blade and you just scrape over the skin to get the cells then you throw it up under a microscope and see if there's icky stickies or grossies in there um, those are medical terms by the way so I'm, I'm joking um, so skin scraping is pretty standard and diagnostic um, electro desiccation so electro electricity um, desiccation is different from electrocoagulation so electro desiccation is a procedure where we literally um, hit it and it creates uh, like a cup at the bottom of it so when we when we blast it we literally are blasting it um, versus electrocoagulation which closes it up and cauterizes it the reason we do it that way is remember we don't want these cells to spread so we basically throw what I would call the atomic bomb on top of it and it leaves a crater up under it um, and we do it that way because we know that we've gotten it deep enough and then it is going to be a little bloody we plug it with a medication versus plugging it with cauterization because if I cauterize it and there's still bad cells in there then all I did was just introduce it back and I just introduced it into the what the capillary stream yikes so we don't want to do that so electrocoagulation is different because it will zap you and then you cauterize it um, and that is to say that it is well and deep enough um, a punch biopsy is literally uh, a utensil that we use that has a, a bore hole in it kind of like if you are trying to gauge your ears up you would go with a traditional hole um, that pierces a hole into your skin it's a little device it doesn't hurt I've had one done um, they put it at the tip after they put some Lido up under there with some epi in there uh, for pain resistance and they will slide it between their thumb and their forefinger so that it rotates and then it takes that piece of the skin out and then they simply just pull it out from there and then they usually stick that in a cup and stick some normal saline on there um, or some form of isotonic and then they check it out for lab studies um, uh, let's see cryosurgery is freezing it so you know the the mole and wart remover that we have that's over the counter it's the same thing only much stronger and then excision or a Morse procedure or a, a Mohs procedure a Mohs procedure is where we take the top layer of the skin off and then at the same time we go one layer deeper and then we take that layer and we biopsy it with a microscope like right then and there so that we know that we have all the cells a lot of times we use uh, an ink derivative which will um, show a blue tinge if uh, you have a hot spot that still needs excision um, and that's how we know that we quote unquote got it all out um, so those are the the diagnostic procedures and surgical therapies all right so some of these procedures they hurt I mean obviously we're throwing electricity on an area that sucks um, you know we're having a, a mini death ray beamed at us um, into our tissue where all of our nerve endings are so that's going to be a problem sometimes these things get a little naughty and mad and we have to do things like wet compresses and soak bath and, and topical medications to soothe the area I don't mean a physical bath I would never tell you in a million years that after you have something where you know you're going down to the dermal layer of tissue the best thing you can do is go sit in a bath with all your dirty cells 
Um, so this would be more along the lines of a sitz bath for that area, but not specifically uh, the actual understanding of a sitz bath. So it's just bathing the area uh, with medication ointment um, and or a lidocaine derivative to soothe the area. Um, and then of course you got your topicals and your wet compresses are if you um, have an area of tissue that you need it to heal a little bit slower on purpose uh, rather than to scab over because it will cause more damage. Okay, so control of itching. Uh, we have medications like Benadryl. Benadryl will affect your nervous system, so it will make you sleepy and that's pretty normal. Um, Benadryl, if it used and used appropriately, the effectiveness will be um, pretty quick and we know that it's effective because it no longer itches. I know those are crazy things to say because we all know those things, but I do recall us talking about that in the test review. So go back and go over it again. I think I talked for maybe a couple of minutes about it. Uh, we have our hydration, wet compress and moisturizers to keep that area of tissue moist because we don't necessarily need all tissues to dry and crust over and create a scab. Sometimes it's not a good idea. Um, keep a cold environment on it. Again, this is one of those things where heat, bad, cold, good. It soothes. Um, breaking the itch scratch cycle. This is really difficult with kids, uh, which is why I'm glad I don't do peds um, because it would drive me nuts. So, so making sure that we break that itch scratch cycle. Sometimes you literally have to just clip your nails and file them down to nubs um, so that you'll stop doing this. Uh, but then people will get inventive and use keys to scratch, which is another terrible discussion for about 50 million reasons. Just know that these are the important things you need to do to soothe the area and to help with um, the control of itching because sometimes it's so bad it feels like you got ants biting you. So of course we want to prevent the spread of infection. When we have one of these procedures, we want to uh, prevent any secondary infection um, and we need to do specific skincare regimens to make sure that we're not spreading things, which is, uh, let's see, hmm, washing with soap and water is probably a good start. Um, using your topical agents to keep your area itch free and moisturize is also good. Um, and make sure that you're watching out for any redness, um, any lines of demarcation, any swollen areas, pustulus, yada, yada, yada. Psychologic effects of these, um, again, with our lady that we had in her case study, the fact that she had a scar was quite terrible. I mean, could you imagine how upset she must be to know that she has no cancer that they found and now she's got this terrible scar? I mean, I couldn't even imagine what that would feel like. I'm being sarcastic. It's silly. If I just found out I didn't have cancer, I'd be super cool with any scar you gave me. But again, this is just uh, the way some people perceive their existence is based off of their physical beauty, um, whatever. Guess what? Uh, pretty fades, flies forever, like it is what it is. Um, just try to reinforce that in the most gentle manner that you can so that these people can get over themselves. Um, some of these are really, really debilitating though. Some of these scars um, will affect a, a face and when you're dealing with ladies and faces are, or pretty people in general, um, if they get something on their face, they think it's unsightly and they're disfigured for the rest of their life. And again, most people dig scars. I'm just saying, it builds character. Um, so again, if we could reinforce those things, that would be great. Um, encourage them to go to support groups if that's a problem. Um, of course, making sure that we camouflage those things with, um, you know, makeups once it's healed over. I, I've never known anyone to be like, here, here's how you get rid of the scar via makeup tips. Um, but sometimes you have to show me a YouTube video because there are, um, there are medications that take care of these things and there are makeups that take care of these things. There's a, a product out right now, I believe it's made by Il Nikaj. Um, that literally takes a port wine stain off of a face instantly uh, because their concealer and um, their foundational product is so thick and viscous but also so light and powdery um, that it, it, you just hit it with it um, and blend over it and a big thick purple port wine stain that would really bother somebody um, if, if 
you know, they were a kid or even in adulthood, it immediately acts like it never even happened. Um, and they have clear, perfect skin. Um, so reinforcing these ideas. And by the way, I'm not plugged by El Makaj. Like, I have nothing to do with them. I just know that their product, product is kind of amazing uh, because I had uh, an aunt that had a port wine stain that literally was over her face, her entire left arm, um, all over her abdomen, her chest, and up and down her left leg. And she had a wedding to go to, and she was embarrassed. And we used this product, and oh boy, oh boy, I had never seen what she looked like without that port wine stain. And she physically cried, and I got angry because then I had to reapply her makeup. So um, just know that sometimes these are really, really debilitating to people. Um, because sometimes these scars go really deep and sometimes that really cuts into a person that's not very comfortable with who they are on the inside and until they get that way which is not up to you um, you need to be sympathetic of that and you need to help them out in the best way that you can okay so the nurse is caring for a patient with anxiety related to a skin condition um, which intervention would be most appropriate at the time for the nurse to add to the patient's plan of care? A, encourage the patient to express feelings of anxiety. I think that's valid. B, use touch to demonstrate acceptance of appearance. Mm, no, because they might not want you to touch them, right? Because if they have an appearance that's unsightly, the last thing that they want you to do is touch them, as evidenced by any Disney movie where the beast is seen for the first time by the beautiful princess, right? Uh, refer to the patient for counseling and further evaluation. Come on, really? Are we really going to call psych because someone's saying that they're unsightly and they're crying? Seriously, like that's too much. And if you do that, shame on you. Um, D, teach the patient use of cosmetics and cover-up techniques. Yeah, sure, but... I, like that's that's a treatment option that is a education option for treatment but we're dealing with a nurse is caring for a patient with anxiety related to a skin condition so anxiety related to a skin condition doesn't mean depression related to disfiguration of skin so for that reason alone I'm gonna say eh. so by default all that's left is encourage the patient to express their feelings of anxiety because if they're anxious and they express it and they go through a cathartic, a cathartic, cathartic experience being able to express that anxiety, it relieves the anxiety. So what do we always say? When you're anxious, you talk it out, right? So I would say A is going to be the answer, and we'll see if I'm right. All right, cool. We encourage the patient to express their feelings of anxiety because it is directly related to the question that talks about anxiety. So that's the easy peasy lemon squeezy answer. Okay, so this is probably my favorite topic of all the topics related to skin because the things that we do are nuts, in my opinion, and uh, cosmetic procedures. Let's see. What do we do? We do simple things um, like microblading to make our um, eyebrows look beautiful while concomitantly using a chemical process so that the other hair follicles don't come in. And yikes, by the way because we're injecting chemicals into our pores and that's awesome in our opinion because it doesn't grow back. Uh, sure, okay. Um, injections, boy, let's see, we've got Volumina, we've got Botox, we've got Restylane, we've got Collagen, we've got, are you ready for this? Hormone replacement therapy that produces new collagen. I'll talk about that in a second. And we've got the old school cement derivative that you can get from an area out of country that will kill you. So people literally die to be beautiful. And again, pretty fades, no matter how hard you try or how much money you have. But guess what's forever? Being fly like this one right here, right? So these topical procedures, um, some of these are acid chemical burns that you have for your face. I've actually done this. I'm not afraid to admit it. Um, and it literally sloughs off the first couple of layers of skin so that you have that nice, plump, beautiful skin up under it. We'll talk about what that looks like because you peel like a crazy person for five to seven days and you are a social recluse because you don't want anyone to see you going through a chemical burn um, that lasts that amount of time because it is 
really scary, especially when you have small children that go, Mommy, what's wrong with your face? So the crazy things that we do to look cool um, never ceases to amaze me. We have laser surgeries. We have facelifts. We have liposuction. We have implants. Um, we have BBLs where we physically stick um, a, a plastic rubber derivative into our behinds. Um, which eventually over the years as shifting occurs, sometimes flips inside out as you are walking, and then you literally have a recessed booty cheek, um, which is amazing to me because you go through all of this and it still fails. So we're going to go ahead and, and jump into these uh, and talk about sometimes what you physically have to go through um, when you're having these procedures. Again, just to look maybe a year to five years younger and for some people that doesn't matter and hey mad respect for wherever it comes from just mad respect on it so we need to make sure how to take care of them after they have these procedures okay so i cannot stress this enough if someone is about to have a procedure where anything goes into any part of their body you need informed consent because if they go back and say well you ruined this uh, you just tap on the paper and goes, oh, yeah, remember where this part says right here. Um, you're not going to sue me because this is an elective procedure that you decided you needed. Um, I gave you all of the education and told you you might get sick off of this. And, hey, guess what? It happened. So, yeah, no, you're not coming at me because I am legally able to put something into your face that you want me to put in your face. And it fails because your face doesn't like it. Um, make sure you get that done. Uh, Post-operative management, obviously we need something for pain. A lot of people think that ibuprofen is good enough for someone that, that had breast surgery. And I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, not only is that a terrible idea, but it's also the worst idea because what does ibuprofen do for post-surgical stuff? Oh yeah, that's right. It reduces inflammation, which is fantastic. Don't get me wrong. But it also increases your incidence of b -b -b bleeding. Um, so we need to obviously talk about that if people decide that that's a good idea, especially when you have people with things like Von Willebrand and they're uh, a hemophiliac. Um, so this is why we have to give the Percocets and the Laura tabs and all of the things that the doctors won't, don't want to give anymore. But they'll be the first one to be like, yeah, I'll give you a big old fat cut up under your breast, but have some ibuprofen afterwards. Uh, no, you guys, if you choose to do these things, super cool, man, go for it. Um, make sure that you understand before the procedure that they are going to give you an actual, an actual narcotic if that is what you are needing, because it is incredibly painful for someone to put an implant into your body. Your body is not used to implants. Your body gets pissed when you put these things into them and it fights back. And a lot of times in fighting back, um, it will send nociceptors to your brain to make pain, telling your brain to tell your body to get it out. So uh, again, ibuprofen, great. If you're a weak post-op, if you're a fresh post-op and they're telling you to go take 800 milligrams of ibuprofen, you know, TID, QID, you can go tell them to get bent and walk out of that place as fast as you can because you need actual pain meds uh, or at least Toradol, which is a, a non-narcotic but is a very strong pain medication. Just make sure that you are having that agreement and discussion beforehand so that you don't wake up and they say, here, here's your Tylenol and you want to hit them but you can't move to do it. Just remember, have that talk. That's all I got for this slide. Okay, so we have um, skin grafts, and skin grafts are kind of cool. Um, they have autographs and isografts. So isograft is when you're taking some, some uh, skin graft from a twin. Um, autographed is from your own body part um, to somebody else. Here's how I remember this because I know Latin. And I'm doing the game where I talk Latin and everyone's rolling their eyes going, gosh, she, here she goes again at it again. But it's really um, this easy. So auto means self. Um, graft means uh, to separate or to compartmentalize. Iso means equal. So twin. So isograft, taking from a twin. Um, or two individuals who are genetically identical would be also the same thing. 
Um, and if I am signing an autograph, I am using my signature. So that's an easy way to do that. Um, reconstructive microsurgery. I uh, usually use bionics for that, which is super cool. Um, I did my doctoral surgical residency in gen surge, and um, I work with Dr. Kara Sidavita, and she is super cool. So she loves gangster rap while she is doing her biotic surgery, which are um, these small utensils that she uses to do microscopic cuts microscopic incisions and microscopic stitches internally which is super cool um, if you ever get an opportunity to sit in on one of these jump on it as fast as you can hug a corner and don't say a single word and just be amazed because that's exactly what's going to happen it is wild to watch these things absolutely wild and if you're lucky and you're like dr karis she'll look at you and go Hey, you want to stitch them up and boy is that ever more fun than playing an xbox game and sometimes you get to pull out stomachs um, when you're doing a, a a lap band procedure or when you're cutting out um, a, a large portion of the stomach to um, start uh, another gastric surgery so that they could retroactivate all of that um, weight gain that they've that they've had over years um, it's like I said super wild when you pull a football out of somebody and understand that the last time it was in their body there were cheeseburgers in there um, it's hot you would never think it would be hot you would think it'd be room temperature but it literally comes out steaming because guess what internal core temperature is hot and surgical rooms are what freezing cold um, so like I said if you ever get an opportunity to do this it is wicked cool if you're a nerd like I am, so jump on it as fast as you can. Okay, so first off, let me make this a little bit bigger. And I, I don't know why I'm so pet peeved about this, but I really want it to say the ABCD business. So let me fix this while I'm reading it because it's going to drive me nuts. So if I don't, there, that makes me happy on the inside. Now, um, a pressure dressing is applied to the face and neck of a patient following facelift surgery. The patient tells the nurse that the dressing feels uh, restrictive and asks if she can loosen it. Uh, what is the appropriate response that the nurse is going to give you? So let's see. The dressing is used to prevent bleeding into the skin. I get that. The dressing will support and secure the incision edges. Nah, that ain't got nothing to do with nothing. If those incision edges need to be supported by a dressing, then you get a terrible surgeon and you need to be screaming, oh wait, you can't because you just have facelift surgery so you can't move your face very much or this, we're going to dehiss and eviscerate and that's going to be a bad day. So that's definitely not the answer. Um, C, addressing is necessary to prevent infection after surgery. No, actually addressing potentially could introduce infection into it if you don't do it right and don't use sterile procedure. So that is not the answer. And let's see, face dressings provide time to become adjusted to the change. <laughs> I'm so sorry, but that reminds me of, if you guys have ever seen Batman, the original one, you know, the, the one that matters with Michael Keaton and uh, the Joker, they try to fix his face after he goes into the vat of toxic chemicals. Guys, I told you I'm a nerd. You have been warned. This should not surprise you. And they go and unfold the dressing and give him a mirror, and he breaks it and smashes it and starts laughing and walks off as Jack Nicholson. If you've never seen it, it's so good. It's so cheesy, but it's so good. Watch it. It'll totally be a game changer for you. So um, that is definitely not the answer, although that is hilarious. Um, so the answer is going to be A. Um, the easy way to remember this for me, because, you know, boxing for a billion years, whenever you get cracked in the face, um, a lot of times it's the bone on the inside that's causing the split of the skin on the outside, right? So whenever you see these guys with the Rocky Balboa face, God, I'm so old, you guys don't even understand these references. It makes me so sad. So... What happens is, is when you get cracked in the face, you get hit in the orbital because you don't know how to duck a punch. Um, it happens. It's no big deal. You get this bulbous face, right? And then the first thing you do is you hit your corner and um, your assistants um, are going to be jumping on two things. They're going to get the bucket of ice and they're going to have a utensil in it uh, that is literally a metal casting. And they're going to knock it right on top of that face. And they're going to push down as hard as they can. And what that does is it stops the swelling, right? Because cold stops 
swelling not heat heat bad swelling cold good cool i cannot tell you that enough because it drives me nuts how, how many times people put hot packs on on things that swell it drives me just nuts so so again it's the same concept right this dressing is used to prevent the bleeding of the skin and and the pooling of that blood and so that it does not swell so that the injury is um, less than what it could be and you don't want a brand new facelift that you've literally pulled the outside of your face and literally pulled it taut and you know pinned it behind your ears and sutured it behind your ears and sutured it up under your hairline the last thing you want to do is introduce swelling because what's it going to do it's going to pop 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 those stitches and those internal sutures and in some cases staples and that's going to be a bad bad day for you you're really going to hate life and wish you would have never done this so make sure that you are reinforcing the fact that they are wrapped up like a mummy not because they need to adjust to the change <laughs> of what they're going to see although I get that. Um, the best answer is to use it to prevent bleeding into the skin because that is the medical answer that's proper while everything else is uh, usually got to do with um, stuff that just doesn't make any sense. Like I said, these are easy to crack the code even if you don't know the answer. Okay, so answer's right. We got through another section. Good job. This is volume two of Integumentary. Um, go over it, take some time with it. I, I pardon myself in advance and you should do the same for my corny jokes because, hey, guess what? It's 434 in the morning and I've not even finished this because I got three more to go. Um, so yeah, just deal with the fact that I'm slap happy and we'll see you on the other side.